According to Plato, polis is man at large. Society is both a microcosm and a macroanthropus. Anthropus, of course, means human. The idea of the microcosm and macrocosm analogy is that in its order, every society reflects the type of men of whom it is composed. Anthropus can also refer to Adamus, or the first human in Gnosticism. Different social orders thus arise from different human types that seek to express their psychic truth upon the environment. As in Socrates' case, however, resistance to certain truths can prove fatal. With any truth we create the enemy who is called a liar. For Plato, the true type is of course the philosopher, while the pseudotype is the sophist. Plato of course concerns himself with the soul, which is dependent upon the philosopher's love for wisdom or Sophia. The true order of man is thus the constitution of the soul. To Aristotle, man was of course an aggregate of his experiences, forming his character around ethical virtues. Such things are necessary in order to theorize and engage in discussions, where one must be able to reenact or empathize or at least understand with these aggregate experiences of others. Aristotle found it difficult to find such men, of course, during the Hellenic polis of his time. To Plato, one must possess Eros and Thanatos. Thus, the life of the philosophical man becomes the practice of dying. When Eros and Thanatos combine with the Platonic dyke, dyke of course can uh, mean justice or transcendental justice in this sense, or the virtue, remember, of the superordination and the subordination of the forces of the soul, through this we mystically pass over via the negativa, the via negativa of course is by negation, towards transcendence, which is basically the subject of the symposium. Thus, through anemnesis, or remembrance, remember, we descend into the unconscious, drawn up to the true Logos. Later explored by Heraclitus and Aeschylus, we know from St. Paul that the Ephesians had known of the triad of love, hope, and faith. To Vogelin, the Platonic Aristotelian theory is superior to all other systems we discussed, since it moves us from an imminent psyche towards a transcendental reality. Thus the psychic shift brought about by mystic philosophers concerning the soul. Outside of imminence, man discovers not only his own psyche, but discovers the divinity of non-human transcendence, i.e. God. As we discussed with Karl Barthes, Transcendence is not to be anthropologically understood or made imminent. God now becomes the measure to Plato instead of man. As Heraclitus stated in his fragments, the invisible harmony is greater than the visible. God, after all, is unknown or unseen, completely outside imminent experience, taken to transcendence. Thus Plato's acceptance of the Xenophantic critique, member Zeno is other which states how as long as men foolishly create gods in their image, God remains hidden and unseen. Thus Plato's creation of theology as well as his inclusion of the study of Gnosis. After all, if the soul is warped to believe the nature of God, it will fall prey to the arch lie. To Heraclitus, deep knowing shows how the border of the soul cannot be reached since the Logos is too deep. Plato's and Aristotle's ideas, of course, outlived the fall of Athens during the Peloponnesian War, and were found to be highly influential in Islamic and Western civilizations. Society, in being represented by transcendental truth, finds itself face to face with the mystic philosopher. And here, of course, we see Christianity's impact upon the Roman Empire. For clarity, Vogelin divides all the truths we have talked about so far into three categories. The cosmological truth of the early empires, the anthropological truths of the Athens, and the soteriological truth of Christianity, which expanded upon Plato and Aristotle's ideas. So for example, Aristotle's idea of friendship being impossible between God and man due to their radical inequality, thus ignoring the grace of God through the incarnation of the Logos in Christ is one example. Through philosophy and Christianity, man has lost Weber's demons. After all, demonism to the Christian is the fall of the spirit from God's grace. Of course, theory being bound to history is naturally meant to move onwards. Moving away from Christianity, of course, has led to our own nihilistic age, 
towards the positivist Superman of Comte, the materialistic Superman of Marx, and the Dionysian Superman of Nietzsche, but we'll return to that later. It was Varro who distinguished between three types of theologies, mythical, physical, and civil. Adopted by St. Augustine, these were reduced to civil, natural, and supernatural theologies. With the fall of Rome arousing the pagan populace, who adhered to the mysteries of Eleusis or Isis, as well as Mithra and Mithraism, there was a split where Nomos adhered to polytheistic practices and Physis adhered to monotheistic practices, and thus the struggle for representation between the two systems. This, of course, ended with the appeal of St. Ambrose, where the Christian emperor serves Christ in a theocratic manner as opposed to a monarchical or monarchy type manner, which became a problem, of course, in the Roman Empire. Theocracy meant the rule of God and not the rule of man or the priesthood itself, of course. In time, the truth of Christianity prevailed over the untruth of paganism. It was during this time that the Stoic Cicero proclaimed how one had two fatherlands, the polis of his birth and the cosmopolis, to deal with the oncoming changes Rome was experiencing. The cosmopolis would play a critical part in imperial Rome, where the empire would try and survive outside a republican constitution, resting on the loyalty of high-ranked patrons and securing military command for acquiring provinces for profitable exploitation. The line between legality and illegality became blurred, most notably in Caesar's crossing of the Rubicon. During this time, to deal with the problem of divine power, Rome became syncretic, right, a mixture of the gods, where divinities were reinterpreted into a political unity of the empire god. Caesar, who was circumcised, tried to merge Baal with Tani before he was, of course, murdered by his patron guards. Similarly, Aurelian used the sun god, the Sol Invictus, which lasted until about 313 AD. Christians, surviving persecution at this time with the help of Constantinus, had the Christian god included into the imperial system of divinity. Of course, Christianity was still incompatible with paganism, refusing to serve two masters or gods simultaneously revolutionizing the divine radically. To destroy the national cult, after all, is to destroy the national cultures. The end of polytheism would end the civilizational epoch and would radically transform the ethnic cultures of the age. It was Philo, Judius of Alexandria, that made Judaism attractive to the empire making the Jewish God a king of kings, making the Jews a chosen people, and making the service of Yahweh the service of God that rules the cosmos in the peripatetic or Aristotelian nomadic sense, which was adopted through uh, Asubius of Caesarea in the time of Constantine. The apostles could thus roam throughout the whole empire and spread the gospel during the Roman peace or Pax Romana, thanks to Augustus dissolving the pluralistic polyarchy for his monarchy of peace. Asubius would praise Constantine as his imperial mirrored the divine monarchy of one nomos and logos, one god and one king of heaven. The problem, of course, occurred with the question of Christ, the one god who was three people in one. The Trinitarianism could undermine the Asubian system, where the emperor represented the one god. And ultimately, this brings about the end of political theology and Orthodox Christianity. For man's spiritual destiny to Vogelin in the Christian sense cannot be represented on earth or by the power of politics. It would later be represented, of course, by the church, lasting through the Middle Ages. But what now of modern nihilistic man, as we previously mentioned? How is he to reconnect to the redivinization of society? Here is where Gnosticism comes into play, which we will save for the third installment of this series.